Brooks Shoes has been a landmark in Nelsonville for many years, touching the lives of almost everyone in town. Mike Brooks recently sat down with Tales of Southeastern Ohio to give us a look at the history of this iconic company and their hopes for the future. Well, hi, I'm Mike Brooks, uh, current uh, interim CEO of Rocky Brands in Nelsonville, Ohio. Well, Mike, the reason we're here today, we're doing some special interest uh, videos on Nelsonville, Ohio. And we know that Brooks Shoe Factory and Rocky Boots have been a part of Nelsonville for much longer than I've been a part of Nelsonville. I know almost all the families in Nelsonville have been touched by Brooks Shoe Factory. My brothers and sisters and mothers all worked there. All my friends worked there at one point in time. And it's just been a, a, a almost a center of, of, of Nelsonville, an important part. And we'd like for you today, if you could, to speak a little bit about the history of Brooks Shoe Factory, how it was acquired, uh, uh, and some of the turmoils that it has gone through <laughs> and got us to where yeah. we're at today. And uh, if you could speak a little bit about that, I think that would well, be Well, Ron, uh, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I, I smile because it's kind of like life. Every, everything isn't smooth. Uh, we have challenges in our lives and our families and and in businesses, but uh, uh, I'll just give you a little of the, the key things that, that I have learned over, over my life. Uh, my, uh, uh, the, the city of Nelsonville built that building, the old shoe factory, uh, with the bricks locally uh, in, the, in, the, uh, th in the late 20s to attract a business way ahead of their time, right. way ahead of their time. Industrial Park. Industrial Park, okay. Uh, so there were a number, I, I believe two or three small shoe factories that started in there uh, and failed. Uh, and uh, uh, McGovern is one of the names that I remember. Uh, I've met one of the McGovern family members that his family started in, in business in Nelsonville. But in 1932, my grandfather, Mike Brooks, and his brother, Bill Brooks, uh, were in the shoe business in Columbus, Ohio, in the late 20s. It was a publicly held company that failed, and they were out of a job. Uh, so they came to Nelsonville, uh, and the city basically said, come here, create some jobs, and the two brothers started making shoes in Nelsonville in 1932. Uh, my grandfather and, and, uh, and my grandmother lived on the east side of Columbus. My grandmother had never seen Nelsonville. Now, Nelsonville was a coal mining town, a lot of bars and saloons. It was kind of rough and tough. Was nothing, anything close to the east side of Columbus, as I can imagine. So as my grandparents drove into Nelsonville with my father, John Brooks, and his sister, Virginia, the first time Grandma saw Nelsonville, she said, Mike, if this is Nelsonville, I don't want to go, uh, as you might expect a city girl. But he said, dear, <laughs> we don't have any choice. We have no job. So it, it started uh, out that way. Uh, my grandfather, uh, mid-career, had a stroke and couldn't speak uh, and was bedridden uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, so uh, my father quit high school in his senior year. His excuse was he cut the end of his thumb off in shop class, so he said he wasn't going to take the test. So he went to work here at 17 years old. And he worked for his father's brother, Bill Brooks, uh, for, for a long, long period of time. He, uh, uh, as every young man in Nelsonville and in, in, in America at the time, ended up in World War II. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, his father uh, was still working here at that time, and it was quite cold and snowy. I'm just giving you a couple little stories. Uh, <clears throat> And, and 
the U.S. government came in and said, you're going to shut down making civilian shoes, you're going to make army boots. So we started to make insulated combat boots. And of course, Dad getting letters from his dad. Uh, and uh, so Dad, there was no cell phones, it was snail mail, okay. It took weeks and weeks to get a mail, mail from Europe. Germany to uh, Nelsonville, but uh, Dad wrote him and said, uh, could you send me a pair of those insulated boots? My feet are freezing. So Grandpa gets a pair, sends his son a pair of boots. They never arrive. They never arrive. Dad writes back and says, where's the boots? Grandpa said, I sent them four weeks ago. As I understand it, they opened every package going into service people in, in, in the war. And I'm assuming that somebody else saw those nice insulated boots and thought they might fit them. Yeah. So grandpa then sent the right boot, the right boot one week and the neck, the left boot the next week, those arrived. Uh, but fast forward, uh, uh, Bill Brooks, uh, sold the business in 1960. William Brooks Shoe sold the business in 1960 to Irving Drew Shoe Corporation in Lancaster, Ohio. And, uh, and, the, and the shoe industry had already collapsed manufacturing-wise in the United States when I said decline as imports uh, became more prevalent. Uh, so the, the business hadn't made money in a long period of time and uh, so Bill Brooks came to my father, Jack uh, Wilson, uh, the secretary, and Earl Steele, and, and, and said, I've sold the business. Uh, the new owner said they'll keep all the management. That's the best I could do for you. So Irving Drew Shoe Corporation, owned by, owned by the Utleys and the Schuylers, two family members in Lancaster, owned this building, or owned this business, and ran it for 15 years, from 1960 to 1975. My father stayed here. He directed all of his uh, children to get an education and move out of here. There was no future. Uh, so we all went different directions. Uh, and uh, so uh, Dad ran this little company for them for 15 years. Uh, with a lot of help from other people in, 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 in the Nelsonville area. And in uh, 1975, Utley's and the Schuylers, the company hadn't made money in three, four years. They wanted to sell it. Well, it's hard to sell a business that hasn't made money. So the only offer they got was from my father. Uh, at that time, he was making $20,000 a year in 1975. Uh, he had no money, raised five children, lived conservatively, uh, and uh, so he made him an offer of 50 cents on the dollar, and that offer uh, was $640,000, which he didn't have, and he had no access to. So he gave him $500 cash to buy this business. Pam and I were living with two children in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And when he called me, I thought I heard he said he bought it. That's what I heard. So I went in the next day to my boss and said, who knew my father? I, it was a tanning. I traveled to the United States and sold leather to these companies that were going out of business. Uh, so my boss wished me well, and Pam and I packed up, and we headed to Nelsonville. So when I got here... Dad was not happy. <laughs> I was not happy. Uh, I said something foolish like I was a pretty good salesman. So he said, if you think you're such a good salesman, go out and get me a loan for $640,000. <laughs> so David Fredericks, who was a chief financial officer at the time, we went from Parkersburg to Columbus. Banks were polite but they never bit. <laughs> they never even got close. So, and this took months and months and months. This was, the owners were just, they let us run the business. They didn't, they let us run the day-to-day -day business, whatever we wanted to do. They didn't have another choice. 
So we were running it like it was ours, but it wasn't ours. Uh, we finally, uh, Clarence Miller, a congressman from Lancaster, Ohio, wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, well, I remember him well also. He, he said, well, you can get a Farmer's Home Administration loan through the U.S. government. So we started down that path. And uh, to make it real quick, uh, uh, once we had a guarantee, a 90% guarantee for that money from the U.S. government, we had banks lining up. So I think it was either four or five banks. So we met up at the First National Bank to close. They had never done one of these deals. There were stacks of paper that everybody had to sign. Signed personally, John and Gloria, Mike and Pam, anybody involved in the business signed personally on the note. And, and everyone was scared to death. The lead bank was the People's Bank of Nelsonville. When I say that, they percentage-wise, they put up the most money uh, of the five banks. Vic Oakley walked in the bank about... There must have been 15 of us around the table, about five minutes late. This is what I remember. He walked in with a blue shiny suit, an old blue shiny suit, a white shirt that was kind of yellow, and a tie with a soup stain on it. He never sat down. He never brought an attorney. He pulled an envelope out of his pocket, threw it on the table, pointed at my dad, and I was in that meeting and said, and David Frederick was, if Johnny Brooks says he'll pay me back, that's good enough for me. Threw the check down and walked out. Everybody just said, whew, this must be okay. So that's how we got started in 1975. That was just to get the, just to get, just to, to try to get on the, the starting line, okay? So we still had $604,000 debt. Uh, and I, I look back, I'm not sure how we got there, but uh, we worked hard. We took some, 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 some risk. Uh, uh, there were three of us, Bob Hollenball, David Fredericks, myself, and Dad. Uh, we were the young guns, and, and Dad was trying to, you know, he was a conservative trying to hold us back. Uh, but we got lucky, and, and we we made some products uh, that were really accepted by the hunting community, and and uh, uh, I said we need to change the name of the company, Dad, uh, and uh, and and we looked at the family name, Brooks Shoe Company. It was William Brooks, and we we needed a brand. I said we need a brand. I go all I, I Wolverine Timberland. I was calling on all these guys and. I said, we need a, a brand name. And uh, the family name, Brooks Brothers Clothing, was suing Brooks Running Shoes. So, so I said, I'll clean this up. I'll said, I said, forget about the family name. I said, we had a successful piece of leather that we sold all over the United States in the outdoor business, and it was called Rocky. I said, let's call this thing Rocky, Rocky Boots. And uh, so... Uh, he agreed to that, and so we we trademarked the name, and we just had one uh, objection to it. The movie, Rocky, the boxer, they said that uh, we could not uh, make or produce boxing shoes. I said, no problem. <laughs> I have no intention of making six pair of boxing shoes. Okay. So, the, you know, we just clawed, clawed our way up. Uh, got kicked a few times and clawed our way up again. Uh, and then uh, that was 75. In 1990, uh, another 15 years, uh, uh, 1990, uh, Dad said, your mom and I aren't comfortable with all the, the debt. Uh, we'd grown the business. We're making some money, but the more you... You kept putting more, more money back in it, okay, and interest rates were high. And so he said, I'm going to give the business to the five of our children. And all of us worked here at that time. So he gave the business to his five children, Barbara, uh, Patricia, myself, Jay, and Stuart, 20% each. And uh, so we went down that same path, and, and then three years later, uh, uh, 
1993, we did an initial public offering. I raised, I think it was $16 million, and uh, we're able to pay off our debts and start to compete with the big guys, marketing, product development. And that was a giant, I think we were the first publicly held company uh, in Athens County. Uh, so that was, a, that was a journey. Uh, I'm just trying to give you a couple highlights. Well, I know when times got hard, all the shoe factories were moving overseas. It was a business decision, they had to do it. You, if you didn't do it, you lost. Yeah. But what I liked about Rocky Boots is they kept their corporate headquarters here in this small town. Yeah. They've always had a connection and they've always been tied to Nelsonville and they've always uh, helped Nelsonville in one way or another. They've always had your support. That's what's special about this business in Nelsonville, in, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of other people's opinion as well. Well, I, I appreciate that, <laughs> and, and you, you read my mind, okay? Uh, the hardest day of my life, the hardest day of my life was having to stop making shoes here. I did everything I possibly could to try to keep that alive. Uh, in the last year that, that we were, and I'm not blaming I'm blaming myself. We lost a lot of money, uh, five, six million dollars, uh, and I was just trying to keep it going one more year, one more year. But there was never an attempt, never, to sell this business. I'd had three majors that I knew that wanted to buy it. I was always polite to them, shook their hand, and told them no thank you. That was Wolverine. Timberland and, and a company by the name of H.H. H. Brown that's currently owned by Warren Buffett. That would have moved everything out of Nelsonville. Right. And I just couldn't fathom that. And uh, I felt we could build here. So uh, there, there, is a, there is a passion for Nelsonville. Uh, we've got smart people here, dedicated people here, just as well as any of those three big companies I mentioned to you. So... Uh, 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 and I'm proud of, uh, you know, we, we started out when Dad bought the, the, the business and it was about two and a half million dollars we were doing in sales annually. And today we will be somewhere between uh, 275 to 280 million dollars. Uh, we have about 2,300 associates. We have a factory in Puerto Rico. Uh, run by a Nelsonville boy, Roger Schultz. Exactly. Roger Schultz's grandfather worked, Milky Odenthal worked for my grandfather. Roger Schultz's mother, Helen, worked for my father. Roger Schultz's two brother and sister, Jim and Linda Schultz, worked for this company. Uh, and Roger's running our Puerto Rican operation, doing a super job. Am I mistaken, or uh, wasn't it your boots that were with the shuttle crews? Uh, it, we had some boots with the shuttle crews uh, and uh, and we've had a lot of input with military over the years uh, and uh, so we, ha we have a broad spectrum of what we offer. We just bought a company well two and a half years ago in Los Angeles called Creative Rec Men's Fashion Footwear you probably never see me in a pair. <laughs> it's a little too fast for me. I'm a pretty conservative guy. But uh, uh, we keep reaching out and expanding. We bought a company called EJ Footwear. Endicott Johnson Footwear was one of the largest shoe manufacturers in America in the 40s, 50s. It failed like everything else and broke up. We bought that company in 2005, I believe, 2005. We bought that company. Now, Dad paid $500 cash. They, his down payment was 500 bucks, 640000 We bought EJ Footwear for $100 million. I don't tell a lot of people that story, but I'll tell it. $100 million, $90 million in cash, and $10 million in Rocky Stock. That was 11 years ago. Uh, that was our largest acquisition. When we started down this road, if you told me 
that uh, somewhere along the line we'd buy, we'd spend a hundred million dollars. <laughs> well, uh, that five hundred dollars that Dad invested <laughs> was probably as important as that hundred. It, it, it really, it really, it really was. It, it's hard to, it's hard to. I look at it like that also. It gave us getting that first step. Getting that first step, uh, but I'm a lucky man. Uh, my brothers and sisters are. Uh, we've had a fortunate ride. Uh, now we're just trying to figure out uh, how to pass it on. Uh, our son works here. Uh, we still a lot, lot of, a uh, lot of family, uh, but a lot of locals, mostly local. Athens, Lancaster. Some people drive from Columbus down here every day. You know, we're still shoemakers. We we still make military footwear in Puerto Rico. Well, uh, today we have a thousand shoemakers in Puerto Rico making boots and shoes. In our Dominican operation, we we've we've been there for almost thirty years, twenty nine years. Uh, we have about uh, maybe nine hundred uh, shoe workers there. Wonderful people. Uh, and, and we'll make about uh, a million pair in that factory also. So we're still shoemakers. Yeah. And then we have an office in mainland China. If you're not in China, you're not in the shoe business. And guess what? It's moving from China to India to Vietnam. I have a hard time thinking about making shoes in Vietnam. I just have a hard time. My brother spent a year there. Five friends of mine never came back from that war, uh, but uh, so you know, our, our goal here is is to find the best avenue to take this company forward in Nelsonville with its roots, make money. If you don't make money, you're not going to be around. It's just that simple. Make money, grow the business, provide jobs. We've got about uh, $15 million a year in payroll in this little town. Now, they take it, some people live in Columbus, in Lancaster, and in, in Logan, in Athens, uh, uh, but uh, that's, that's a big number. And when we started, our whole revenue income for the company was only $2.5 million. So the bigger you get, the more you can pay, and the more benefits you can have, so. But it's it's a it's a it's a balancing act. You can you can go too fast, and or you can go too slow. Right. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and I can see with the world markets, any manufacturing tends to move where the wages are affordable in order to compete with the people in that particular business. If you don't do it, you lose. So it's a moving target. I would say pretty much every three or four years. I, I can see it moving around toward Vietnam. It, 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 it does. I, I, I remember, I remember uh, uh, Japan made a lot of trinkets and things yeah. for us, right? Exactly. And, and now they make high-tech stuff. I remember South Korea uh, after the war, after the Korean War. Devastated country, devastated. Cheap labor. The world went there. Taiwan. As those economies improve, then the needle industry for apparel and footwear moves. It's just what it does. And, and when people criticize me for not making shoes here, the answer is very simple. If you want to pay $300 a pair for shoes, you can make shoes in America. If you want to pay $100 for the same quality, the same shoe, you got to make it someplace around the world. That's just the facts. Well, you can lose it all if you bet it all in one place. Then you're out. Right now, I mean, that provides a nice tax base from, yeah. for Nelson, yeah. even the people in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Nelson, they, they, they do. They, yeah. they, they do. Florida. Columbus. Columbus. Yeah. But, but I've had them come from Florida and work also. Right. Uh, I've got a gentleman that drives down every day from Dublin, Ohio. Hour and a half, one way. Worked for us for 11 years. I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mile away. <laughs> I can do that 
quicker than I could make the other grade. Well, uh, that's true. I worked at Rio Grande for uh, two years. Oh, wow. Rio Grande University. Yeah. I'd get up at four o'clock in the morning to okay. drive down there, and there's no good way to get there. No, there isn't. I loved the job, but I hated to drive. The drive was tough. So uh, was he's a dedicated employee. But you do things for your family and yourself. Uh, but but jobs are the key to success. Education, Hawking College. Yes. Education, Ohio University. Get an education. Uh, and then you have a chance to find the job in the income level that can sustain you and grow, you, take care of you and your family. It's it's that simple. I know. I over the years I've worked several places, had several different jobs, project managers and maintenance advisors. I have people tell me every day, "You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't listen to those kind of people," because I'm sure in their mind they can't do that. Right. But they don't see the drive or the vision that yeah. other people have sometimes. Uh, they don't. I just kind of put that aside and hope they're not right. Well, uh, I'm a little stubborn sometimes. <laughs> and, and uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just looking for the team that can take this company to the next level. Uh, and and we're, we're, we're working on that. Uh, we've got some great people. Uh, we have a wonderful board of directors. Uh, two thirds of my board of directors are Ohio University grads. Uh, I learned pretty early on that uh, we're a little different down here. So yeah. I want somebody that at least spent four years in Athens County. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, once I got the Bobcats on the board, uh, uh, I had a workable board. Uh, at one time I had uh, Stan, uh, a gentleman uh, that was with Timberland when Timberland was birthed, uh, a gentleman that was a senior uh, president of Europe for Levi Strauss, and a gentleman that ran 23 shoe factories on the Ohio River uh, from Pittsburgh to Indiana. Uh, and they just wanted to run the business. I mean, they, 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 just, they didn't want to follow anybody. They, they just wanted to run the business. Right. So I got I got wonderful people, smart, good questions, tough guys, successful. That spent four years in Athens County. Made a difference. It, it will make a difference. Made a big difference. Well, I know I appreciate the uh, Rocky keeping things local as much as possible. I'm sure the rest of the people in else still do as well. And, Thank you for your time today. Well, th thank you. I'm, I'm always pleased to talk about uh, my second love, uh, this company. My first love is my wife, who I've been married to for 50 years. So, uh. I'm glad you got that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been taught well. <laughs> yeah, I'm at 49. Right well, now. You, 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 we, we just celebrated our 50th two weeks ago. Mike was also kind enough to give us a tour of the old Nelsonville City Building and Fire Department that is now an office building for Rocky Brands. Ah, closed in with a window on it. It was originally a porch, 
This is his apartment. 